Hi everyone and welcome to Unit 7, Module 33, Forgetting Memory Construction and Memory Improvement. Here are your learning objectives and here is your vocab. So let's talk about first why we forget. So forgetting is actually really important. It allows us to dump out old information, clear our brains, allow us to kind of organize our thoughts better, be more creative, um, think more abstractly. Um, there are people, just interesting information, there are people who have something that's called um, superior autobiographical memory and they can remember everything that has happened to them at any given moment of their life. Like you can say, you know, 40 years ago on this random day, what were you wearing? What conversation did you have? And they can remember it exactly anything. Um, so they find that people with that have a harder time doing these things like being creative and organizing their thoughts. So there are two different kinds of amnesia. So you'll recall that amnesia means a brain injury. So you can have a brain injury that is anterograde amnesia and that it's an inability to form new memories. So anything you have an, in, you have a, um, an injury something, some sort of trauma to you, and then you can't remember th anything after that event. So think if you've seen the movie 50 First Dates, that's like she wakes up and she doesn't know anything that's happened. Um, so retrograde amnesia is an inability to retrieve info from one's past. So you can't remember anything from before the accident. Someone with anterograde, so can't remember new memories, but they can form new implicit memories. So recall from last module that implicit memories um, use the cerebellum and the basal ganglia and people can still have those implicit workings like they can learn how to ride a bike for example and still have that kind of information the next day even though they don't remember anything that happened in that day in terms of explicit memory. So you can have three different kinds of failure in recalling information. The first could be you had encoding failure. Generally, encoding failure means you did not create the memory because you were not really paying attention to that detail. Um, so maybe you're sitting in class, but you're not really paying attention even though you're hearing the teacher, you're not paying attention to that information, you're not putting it in your working memory, and so it never encodes. You never actually store that information. You can have storage decay, where it's the information's there, it was encoded, but over time that memory decays and it goes away. So Herman Ebbinghaus did an important study on storage decay where he learned a bunch of nonsense syllables, again, he tested his recall from 20 minutes after that study session to 30 days later. And the key with this study, the thing you need to know, is that there was a rapid, quick decline of information loss. But after that, it levels off. So if you look, for example, at day, t at day three, right, and how much they recalled, it's really similar to day 25, if not the same. So it really drops a lot in those first couple of days and hours, but then it levels off and it kind of stays the same. So retrieval failure is the third kind of failure to know, and that means you've encoded fine, you've stored it fine, but in that moment, you cannot retrieve it. There's also something that sometimes comes up related to this, and it's not a vocab, but it's called tip of the tongue phenomenon. And that's when you have, you know, you, you know that you know the answer or the word that you're trying to think of. It is on the tip of your tongue, right? But you cannot come up with it. So tip of the tongue phenomenon is the inability to access that word. So it's a type of all right, so when we are forgetting, this 
sometimes, you know, we don't have brain injuries, we just forget stuff. And that is called interference. So there are two different kinds of interference to know, and these can be confusing. And I'll, I'm going to give you a trick in class for this. So proactive interference is when old information blocks the retrieval of new information. So you go to Spanish class and you learn Spanish and then you go to French class and you're learning French and let's say you take a quiz in the French class but your Spanish rules of language are blocking your ability to recall the French rules. So the old information is blocking your ability to recall the new information. That's proactive. Retroactive is when that new information is blocking your ability to recall the old stuff. So again, you go to Spanish class, then you go to French class, and then you're in French class and someone asks you a question about they're doing their Spanish homework and someone asks you a question about a Spanish rule or word and you can't remember it because now the French is blocking your recall of the old. So new is blocking old in retro. So info is best recalled if it's presented before sleep because we're actually pr protected from retroactive interference. You learn the information, you go to bed, no more thoughts. <laughs> so you're protecting your brain from any sort of new information blocking the information you just learned. There's also something called positive transfer and this happens to us all the time and that's when previously learned info helps our learning of new info. So just think about it as learning built on learning, right? So for example, if you took an anatomy class before your intro psych class, that information might have been useful to knowing some of the information in this class or your English classes have been helpful in you understanding some of these words, or perhaps Latin has helped you with some of these prefixes and suffixes and understanding word meaning. So all of that is an example of positive transfer. So motivated forgetting. This is just our um, desire sometimes to we don't recall things because we don't want to recall them. If someone asks, hey, we had 50 cookies in this house, and I only ate five of them, so where did the other ones go? And you're like, I don't know, I only ate 10. Well, maybe in reality you ate like 20, but you don't, you're not motivated to remember all of the times you went in there and snagged a cookie because that's not a desirable thought for you. And Freud, our psychoanalysis perspective, he said that when things are really undesirable, we actually repress our memories and we banish them from our conscious thought and we don't know that they're there. Um, repression. There's also something called reconsolidation where we have kind of forgotten something and something like some sort of retrieval cue has reactivated that memory from the past which is sort of like repression. So misinformation. We're going to talk about Elizabeth Loftus, who did many, many studies, over 200 studies on, she really focused on when we don't remember or we remember incorrectly. She did a famous study on misinformation effect. And so misinformation effect is when we end up incorporating misleading info into our memory of what really happened. And she focuses a lot of her research on eyewitnesses and how sometimes they get it wrong and like really wrong. And they're not trying to. They really believe what they're saying. This is just a product of how our brain reconstructs what happened. So she did a study where they watch a video and two cars get into an accident. She asks one group, how fast were these cars going when they made contact? She asked the other group, how fast were these cars going when they smashed into each other? The group that was asked the leading question of how fast these cars were going when they smashed into each other reported 10 miles per hour faster and they reported there was broken glass on the scene when in fact there was no broken glass. And in their memories, when they're reconstructing it, they actually see that. So just that change of that word creates 
a different memory recall. It, they're, when they're reconstructing that situation, it is now altered because someone else went in there and messed with their memory. So she says that our memory is more like a Wikipedia page where we can go in and mess with our memory and pull it up, but other people can also go in and mess with that and say, hey, remember that time in fifth grade when blah, blah, blah? And you're like, yeah, I do remember that. Maybe it didn't happen or maybe it didn't happen exactly that way. Um, but our memories can be messed with in that way. There's also something called imagination inflation, where if we keep repeatedly imagining that something happened, we actually think that it did happen. And that's a false memory. Source amnesia, this is just attributing to the wrong source an event that we have experienced or an event that we've heard about or read about or imagined. But we're getting the source of that wrong. And this is a key player in those false memories, like someone telling us that they saw something or that something did happen when we didn't actually see it or hear it. Um, if you are an artist and you're writing music and you're writing lyrics, right, you might accidentally incorporate some lyrics that someone else has already used because you've heard them. It's familiar to your brain and your brain wants to say those words, not realizing that you're actually taking someone else's work. So that would be um, an example of source amnesia. Deja vu, I'm sure you're very familiar with the idea of that, and it's that eerie sense that we've experienced something before. And really this is cues from our current situation, and they're triggering these unconscious um, we don't know why, right? In deja vu, it feels really eerie or weird because we can't explain it. But what it really is, is that that situation feels familiar to us in some way. Whatever feeling it's giving us, or there's something about it that is giving us familiarity. So maybe you can be in a new part of the world that you've never been to, but you're in this coffee shop there and there's something about it that reminds you of some other place. So you're not consciously thinking like, oh, this reminds me of such and such place. It's an unconscious thing. And that's kind of why it feels so weird. Like, whoa, I remember you've said this to me before or you've done that before. And it's just because you've been in a similar situation. So do we repress or construct memories of abuse? So there is there's a lot of debate about repressed memories and if people can repress like horrible things that have happened to them from childhood. And a lot of psychologists from around the world got together and they come, came up with a few bulleted points that they could all agree on. And the first thing is that they wanted to say that memory work, and that means like guided imagery, because remember, think of like false memories. That's not good. Hypnosis is not a useful tool for remembering things. It's useful for other things, but not for memory. Dream analysis, all of those are not good ways to deal with memory. Um, so what do they agree on is that sexual abuse happens. It happens more often than people talk about or um, think that it happens. And injustice happens, again, more often than people discuss. And forgetting happens. Recovered memories tend to be incomplete. It doesn't make them untrue. Um, it just makes them incomplete. Memories before three are unreliable. Remember, we discussed infantile amnesia. Hypnotic memories are unreliable. Just explain that. And memories, whether they're true memories, like they actually happen, or false memories, like this idea has been implanted in you and you believe it, it's either way, that's traumatic. So finally, typically anything that is very emotionally charged, we talked about flashball memory and how uh, all that glucose shoots up into the brain and we really remember vivid details. It doesn't mean that we can't get some information wrong there and altered, but people don't repress, meaning put in their unconscious things that were traumatic. 
if, if someone, if you ask a survivor of the Holocaust, you know, no one's repressing that situation. They remember that and they can give you vivid details of things that they experienced decades later. So this is just like a summary and the book kind of goes through all the ways that we've discussed, but putting them all together, all these ways that you can use this research in remembering and forgetting to do better in school. So this is a really useful list. Um, it's kind of reviewing, but the book puts this in here. So you might want to pause and write these down because you should know them. So takeaways, there are confusing terms in this module, anterograde amnesia and retrograde amnesia. Antro is anything after the injury. So you can think A for after. Retro is anything from before. They forget everything before. Proactive interference, which is typical forgetting, is when our old information is blocking our new information. Remember our old password now we can't remember a new password. Retro is when that new password or that new information is blocking our ability to remember. Um, remember that memories do not play like a recording. They are reconstructed. And because they are reconstructed, it's really like that Wikipedia space where we go and manipulate it every time we construct it. But also people around us influence our memories and we see those and they become part of our memories and people do not typically repress emotionally charged situations. So that wraps up module 33 and